We posted another video on Philosophy Tube's presentation of Kant's philosophy, more particular about his uh, critique of pure reason. And we were pointing out some what we think are pretty obvious errors in how Philosophy Tube presented that philosophy. Interestingly enough, uh, one day after we posted that video, Philosophy Tube posted another video where the presenter, Abigail Thorne, came out as uh, a trans woman and that video attracted a lot of attention and somehow as a fallout of this, I suppose, our video got a lot of attention too. There were quite a few comments. We are taking this opportunity today just to simply respond to these comments. There were some comments on excusing basically Philosophy Tube for not being super experts on Kant and, and that's fine and I won't address that. In the second half of my video I was basically pointing out two things. Number one, that the presentation of this video on Kant by Philosophy Tube put as I saw it, more effort on profiling the presenter rather than going very deep into Kant's philosophy. And I thought that this was a reason why uh, the, the video had quite a few mistakes. And secondly, connected to that, I was pointing out that this popular presentation of philosophy, basically by some philosophy influencer on the net, uh, is a form of commodification. Uh, of philosophy. The comments that I'm addressing today were about this commodification of philosophy, which I think is an interesting topic and uh, particularly now that we have so many uh, different forms of presenting philosophy within a capitalist context, I just want to talk about that briefly. Uh, so I'll just quote a few comments here as examples for what people said. Uh, one comment reads by Mary Young with Zero One Macomb, your comments regarding this philosophy tube video being a commercial activity are dead on. And then Andy Shaw says, criticizing me, more than a bit hypocritical to call Abigail's videos commodification of philosophy when you are making YouTube philosophy videos about YouTube philosophy videos. You are contributing to the commodification too. And then the final one I'm quoting is from Tara Stahler. How is Philosophy Tube commodifying philosophy? She's presenting philosophical education for free. Sure, she has a Patreon, but everyone needs to earn money under the effed up system of capitalism. And it's a hell of a lot better than the gatekeeping that academic institutions and publishers engage in. So this was interesting to see that uh, these comments were being published uh, because it relates to a very old topic in philosophy, the commodification of philosophy. It's not just a thing that we are now thinking about under conditions of capitalism, but it goes at least back to ancient Greece, uh, where Socrates is basically criticizing the school of the sophists uh, who are selling philosophy for money, who were training people in philosophy so uh, that they could become something like professional speakers and that they could uh, convince others uh, to make certain political decisions or things like that. Uh, they were basically professional for-profit uh, philosophy coaches. Socrates thought that this wasn't okay, philosophy shouldn't be commercialized in that way. So this is an age-old topic, philosophy as a commercial product. First of all, I'd like to say the commenters who criticized me uh, are perfectly correct. Of course, academic philosophy also happens within uh, the capitalist system and is also a form of commodification of philosophy. I'm getting paid for what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm actually fortunate enough to get paid quite well, uh, maybe even too well, if you compare it with many other jobs that people do that are actually much harder than mine. So yes, uh, these uh, critiques are absolutely correct. However, I think uh, it's still worth looking at the differences in how philosophy is commodified in the education system and how philosophy is commodified on the internet. Uh, these are, I think, two very different types of commodification that we should take into account. First, let me talk briefly about commodification of the education system. It's interesting, we looked at the viewer statistics last night, and most of the viewers of the video, by far the majority is from the US. The second largest group is from the UK. And both of these countries, specifically the US, have a highly commodified education system. So viewers seem to take it for granted that going to university is somehow expensive. Actually, in most other places of the world, basically in all places where I taught in 
my life. Uh, that is not the case. In these places, university education and in its context philosophy is a publicly funded institution, just like you have public health systems or you have uh, other public systems like public transport systems in some countries. Where I grew up in Germany and where I attended university, uh, basically all universities with a few exceptions uh, are public and are more or less free. There's a very minor fee that you have to pay and, and it's very similar here in Macau where I'm teaching, where also uh, the universities are public and uh, the tuition fees are uh, compared to the US and the UK uh, really very minor. So it's actually not the case that this is the standard thing, that education and philosophy education has to be highly commodified. I, I would think there's a very low degree of commodification of education and thereby of academic professional philosophy if you have a public education system. So for instance for me it is uh, strange that uh, people on the left today, particularly in the US and the UK, are not more radical uh, in demanding to have a public education system. I understand there are demands uh, to forgive student debt, but the point is not to forgive student debt. The question these people have to ask themselves is why is there student debt in the first place? And there is student debt because the education system is not public. So um, I think that would be uh, the primary demand. And this brings me directly to the second point. Tara said in her comment that bringing philosophy, making philosophy public by putting it on the internet is a hell of a lot better uh, than than, uh, what's happening in the UK. As I said, I'm not so sure. I think it would be a hell of a lot better if the education system would be generally public, if it would be, sorry to say that, so frankly, a more socialist approach to education. I think that would be a hell of a lot better. Because actually, if you move philosophy education from the university, from the academic system to the internet, to the social media, uh, then two things happen. First of all, commodification does not disappear. It takes on a different shape and probably uh, actually a much more kind of aggressive shape uh, because Tara was asking uh, how is philosophy commodified there? Well, uh, as basically all viewers know, uh, on the internet, on social media, the product is you. Uh, your views, your data, uh, this is the product. So this is like a, a much more intense form of commodification when all viewers become part of this profit-making system. So I don't think that's innocent at all. Uh, secondly, in this context, what happens is, of course, because it's about attracting attention, because it's about attracting views, is what I talked about in the first video, uh, how the emphasis and the effort of the production of philosophy shifts to the presenter rather than to the content. So I think that's an, a direct effect of the commodification of philosophy as it takes place uh, on the internet, on social media, that quite naturally, because it's all about attracting views, uh, you have to make the presentation itself the main product, not the content. And that's somewhat different, at least in theory, from the traditional education system, where people become professors like me, at least traditionally, not because of their presentation skills, but because uh, they somehow know more about Kant than others. Uh, so that is a traditional selection criteria. So you have to prove your expertise in your actual field, rather than to prove your expertise in uh, looking fine and, and getting as much attention by as many people as possible. Uh, and I, again, like I'm not really sure if that's a good development uh, for philosophy as such, and I, probably Socrates would agree with me on this one, uh, that philosophy shouldn't be primarily about the presentation, uh, but should be primarily about the actual ideas and the content. This being said, though, uh, of course philosophy also in an academic context and in previous older contexts like in early Greece there was like a public sphere in which philosophy took place. This being said, philosophy was always also about presentation. It's just um, it's a matter of degree, right? And it seems to me that on the internet uh, there is a massive shift uh, of emphasis towards presentation. Uh, so I'm not saying that presentation doesn't matter, it does matter, and it's important that it matters, uh, also in education, also in, in, uh, in the public sphere. Uh, but uh, really, you have to understand if, you, if philosophy moves to the social media, the manner of presentation that is supposed, again, to attract viewers, to attract attention, and to profile a host, you, you should be aware what this does to philosophy. So, both in education and in the social media, we are operating within a capitalist system, within a system that commodifies to an extent uh, also 
philosophy because it commodifies basically everything. And secondly, also in education, we have always been focused on uh, presentation, but maybe not as much and not in the same way as we are focusing if we do philosophy in the social media. So in this sense, uh, in both cases, uh, we are sort of within a matrix that even by criticizing it, like I'm doing now, we are at the same time supporting and, 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 and proliferating this structure, right? So uh, as some viewers pointed out, now I'm making um, a social media movie criticizing the social media presentation of philosophy. So while I'm criticizing the social media presentation of philosophy, I'm doing and I'm proliferating uh, the very system which I'm criticizing. And this is based basically unavoidable, it's inescapable, right? Uh, otherwise I couldn't communicate. The same thing happens in academic philosophy where you can criticize the commodification to a certain extent of, of the academic system. And while you're doing this, at the same time, you're getting paid for what you're doing. So this is basically, I think, the case with every critique that it typically takes place within the structures that it critiques and thereby at the same time perpetuates the structures. However, uh, at least we can make these structures obvious. And interestingly enough, to connect back to the first video that we made about Kant, I think that's the most important point for me, at least, about Kant's philosophy, Kant's notion of critique. Critique for Kant basically means to understand the structures under which we are necessarily operating. While we are operating within these structures, at the same time we can critically expose these structures. Uh, Kant uses the famous expression reflecting on the conditions of the possibility uh, under which we operate. So I, I think this still can be done and this is actually for me at least, uh, the core task of philosophy in society. And again, I think this is at least for me the main contribution that Kant made to philosophy to really uh, define and, and, and perform a critique in that way. Of course, for him it wasn't social critique, it was mostly a critique of conscious, but in the philosophical tradition that came out of Kant, then we get very soon uh, to a social form of critique. So today's notion of critique also a social critique, uh, goes very much back to Kant's notion of critique. And uh, unfortunately you cannot learn this from Philosophy Tube's video uh, on uh, Kant's critique of pure reason. As far as I remember it doesn't really discuss this which I think is the most important point and particularly in a social media context. Having said that critique consists in the critical reflection on the conditions of the possibility of how we operate uh, we're going to do another video critically reflecting on the presentation not only of philosophy but of ourselves, of our identity on and through the social media. And we're going to look at another Philosophy Tube video uh, to illustrate this. Typically, and I'm not talking about uh, Philosophy Tube or Abigail Thorne here in person, but uh, as a general tendency, of, let's say, influence of philosophy on the social media is that while they criticize a lot of things, they're not very critical in the Kantian sense in that they typically do not critically reflect on the conditions of the social media under which they operate. So I think this is something that at least we can contribute and should contribute when we do philosophy on the social media that at the same time uh, we reflect critically on the conditions under which we operate. Uh, so uh, that's why we decided for this video that we will end it uh, with a warning. And the warning is that this video is produced for attracting your attention and to promote this channel. The platform you are using at the same time is designed to be addictive and to mine your data for profit. And you should know that.